Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Let's go ahead and get started. Welcome back. This is the um, third and final lecture in this um, Introduction to Reinforcement Learning. The ambition for today is to, um, to cover the uh, essentials of policy gradient methods, and then what, in whatever time we have remaining, we can do um, a brief introduction to model-based reinforcement learning. Um, so yesterday we already started on policy gradient methods, so let me just give a really quick review about what we already talked about. Uh, policy gradient methods are a family of methods that explicitly optimize a policy for a given MDP by performing gradient ascent. So we explicitly parameterize our policy with some um, parameters theta, um, and then we estimate the gradient of the expected return with respect to theta. This is this quantity J, it's like a, um, the value functions that we've been seeing so far, but now where we marginalize out the state. Um, and these are useful in a lot of settings, in particular when we have continuous actions and the greedification step uh, that would be required by a pure value function approach such as Q-learning or SARSA um, is in itself a difficult optimization problem. So we saw a simple derivation of the likelihood ratio or score function estimator, which gives us a nice way of estimating the gradient from, from one or more samples. So we basically are able to manipulate the gradient so that it looks like an expectation, and then we can estimate that expectation um, using samples. So the policy gradient theorem extends that idea to a full MDP, where we have, a, um, um, where we have an episode that lasts more than one time step. The expectation then becomes with respect to this discounted ergodic occupancy measure, which again we can estimate using sample returns. So um, in, the, in the gradient we have this term, in the policy gradient theorem we have this term which corresponds to the, um, this factor which corresponds to the true value function of the current policy. Of course we don't know that. So uh, what we want to do is replace that with any unbiased estimate of the value function. The simplest unbiased estimate we can construct is the sample return itself, yielding an algorithm called reinforce. This is kind of the first policy gradient algorithm that was um, introduced. It actually precedes the policy gradient theorem. Um, now, we know from our previous discussion of uh, value function methods that um, just taking a Monte Carlo approach where we learn everything from sample returns is not going to um, hit the sweet spot of the bias variance trade-off. So that's why, um, you know, in general, we prefer temporal difference methods that bootstrap off an estimate of the value function rather than just relying on sample returns. So we can bring that idea over to policy gradient methods, yielding a family of algorithms called actor-critic methods. Now, actor is just another name for a policy, and critic is a value function which is um, learned from data and used to construct an estimate of the gradient um, that is followed by the actor to improve the policy. So, you know, if we, if we look back at the policy gradient theorem, here we had this Q pi was the true value function for some policy pi. In reinforce, we replace that with a sample return. Well, in an actor-critic method, we can just uh, replace it with our estimate of the value function as represented by a critic. And this critic can be trained using exactly the same temporal difference methods that we already saw in the previous lectures. So this figure kind of shows um, how it works. The agent interacts with the environment using its current policy. That policy generates um, a trajectory, tau. That trajectory is fed into the critic, so using a temporal difference algorithm, we then update our critic. Then using the critic, um, together with the trajectory, we, we construct an estimate of the, um, of the gradient. We take a, a step along that gradient to improve our actor, and then we use the new actor to generate more data, and the process repeats. Um, okay, so I mentioned yesterday, in policy gradient methods, kind of the key practical issue is the variance in the gradient estimate. Reinforce is a very simple way to derive a policy gradient method, but in most applications, it's totally unusual because the variance of the gradient estimate built from that sample return is so prohibitively large. It makes learning difficult. So there are a number of tricks for controlling this variance, um, and the one that is most commonly used in reinforcement learning uh, in policy gradient methods 
is called um, a baseline, and a baseline is a, a, like a special case of a general variance re uh, reduction technique called a control variance. So if you're not familiar with control variance, this slide um, gives you a, a quick background. So um, let's suppose we have some random variable x, we're interested in its expected value, and we have an unbiased estimator x hat of, that, of, of its expectation. So x hat is an unbiased estimator of the expected value of x. Okay, we don't know what the expected value is, but we have an unbiased estimator of it. Now let's suppose that there's another random variable y hat, which is an unbiased estimator of another random variable y. Sorry, y hat is an unbiased estimator of another random variable y. And the expected value um, of y is known. Okay? So for x, this is, this is the quantity we're interested in. And for y, um, we, we have another unbiased estimator, and we actually know what the expected value of y is. Then using y, we can construct another unbiased estimator of x, x hat prime, which is our original unbiased estimator, minus this term here. So what we've done is taken this other random, uh, this other estimator, y hat, and we subtract off its expected value. Okay? So that means this term here, the expected value of this term is zero. So that ensures that um, if x hat was um, an unbiased estimator, so will x hat prime be unbiased. Okay, so we went from one unbiased estimator to another. What was the point? Well, if we look at the variance of this new estimator, that's what's shown here, we can see that um, if x and y are sufficiently correlated, then there will be some value of this hyperparameter lambda such that the variance of the new estimator will be lower than the variance of the old estimator. So if x and y are sufficiently correlated, then the magnitude of this term will be, will be large, and then for some suitable choice of lambda, this term will be less than this term. Uh, sorry, yeah, so the magnitude of this term will be greater than the magnitude of this term, yielding uh, an estimator with lower variance than the original one. So that's the idea of control variance. If you can identify some other quantity that's correlated with the quantity of interest and whose expected value is known to you, you can use that to reduce the variance of your estimator while uh, um, retaining the, the property of it being unbiased. Okay, so in policy gradient methods, a very commonly used trick is to alter the um, equation for the policy gradient, for the, for the policy gradient estimate, to introduce a new term called the baseline. So the baseline is here. And the rule is, the baseline can be anything you like as long as it doesn't condition on the, on the action. It can condition on the state, but it cannot condition on the action. So here we're taking this Q value of some state action pair. We can use the state, but not the action in the baseline. Um, right, and so what's shown here is a little proof that um, the estimator remains unbiased as long as we follow this rule. As long as our, our um, baseline doesn't condition on the action, um, it remains unbiased. Um, and the reason is that the, um, the, the new term that we've added, so this B, this B of S here, the baseline, gets multiplied by this thing here. This thing here is called the score function. So remember when we derived this policy gradient estimate, we used the score function trick. It's called the score function trick because this term is called the score, okay? It turns out the expected value of the score is zero. So if we look back at our um, rule for control variance, we said we take um, this other random variable and we subtract off its expected value. So what we're gonna do is prove the expected value of the score is zero, therefore we don't need to subtract anything off, therefore just adding this baseline gives us a control variant that, that um, doesn't introduce bias. So why is this term unbiased? Let's look at the, at the following proof. So what we're doing here is kind of the score function trick in reverse. So this, this here is the expected value of the new term that we added to our policy gradient estimate. So without this, without this term, we would just have our original policy gradient estimate. Now doing the score function trick in reverse, we note, okay, this log, this um, gradient of the log probability becomes this fraction. Um, now if we just write explicitly what this expectation is, it's a sum that's weighted by these policy probabilities. These policy probabilities here cancel, um, yielding this term. <coughs> we can move the gradient outside the summation 
and the term inside the summation is the sum of all the policy probabilities given the current state. And those probabilities will, of course, sum to one. And the gradient of one is constant, so, so it's zero. So uh, as long as we don't condition on the action, we don't introduce any bias, and uh, we just need to find some baseline that conditions um, at most on the state and which will be highly correlated um, with this other term here. Uh, so what would be a good choice for a baseline? The most common choice is the value function. We're looking for something which is correlated with Q, but which doesn't condition on the action. So V so sounds like an ideal choice. So remember we mentioned yesterday there's this, there's this thing called the advantage function. The advantage function is just Q minus V. So if I choose my uh, baseline to be V, then this term here, Q minus B, becomes Q minus V. Q minus V is just A, the advantage function. So this is what our gradient looks like. It's just like the original um, gradient, but inside that advantage function is our variance reducing baseline. Um, okay, so one more trick which is commonly used in practice. So um, if we want to use this if we want to use this advantage function in our gradient, we will need to estimate the um, Q function. So the advantage function is Q minus V, so to do this we will need Q. It turns out in practice Q can be much harder to learn than V. So V is simpler because we have to condition only on the state, but um, for Q we need to condition on the state action pair. So we may have some, some large complex or continuous action space. Um, but even for, for a small, discrete action space, unless we have explored the environment really well, our ability to predict the Q value for actions that are not selected with high probability according to the current policy will likely be quite poor. So um, a good Q function is quite hard to come by. A critic that represents Q will be hard to train, whereas V is a lot easier to learn. So if we're in that situation where we can feasibly learn V but we can't learn Q, then we can replace the advantage function with an unbiased estimate of the advantage function. And that unbiased estimate of the advantage function is constructed just using a bootstrap. So rather than, rather than querying the critic for um, an estimate of the value function, we construct an estimate of the value function on the fly using a sample reward and then adding in the discounted value of the next state. So if you remember, with reinforce, we were using the whole sample return to construct the gradient estimate. Sorry, was there a question? I don't know where that was coming from. Okay. Um, with reinforce, we constructed the whole gradient estimate using the sample return. Then we went to actor critic methods. We went to the other extreme and said, forget about the sample return. We'll just use the uh, critic that we've learned from data. So what we're doing now is taking one step back in the direction of reinforce by saying, actually, Let's use one sample reward, not the whole return, but just one sample re reward, and then bootstrap. So, um, yeah, we're, we're accepting a bit more variance, but with the benefit of not having to represent this more complex value function Q. Now, if we replace, um, in this expression here, Q minus V, if we replace Q with this bootstrap target, then we get this quantity here, which might look familiar to you. This quantity is just the TD error. So if our estimate of the value function is based on this bootstrap target, and we have a variance reducing baseline based on V, then this whole term in the gradient becomes the, the TD error. So this is like the TD error based um, estimate of the policy gradient. Yeah. Oh yeah, th so that's a good question, yeah. Um, so, yeah, here we said lambda, that, you know, there exists some lambda that will reduce the variance. Um, so you can write down an expression for the optimal lambda, but uh, I don't remember what it is off the top of my head, but it will depend on some unknown quantities. So you will then need to estimate those quantities from data in order to try to figure out what a good lambda is. In practice, when people use policy gradient methods, they assume that's too hard to do usefully, and they just fix lambda to one. You're welcome to try to optimize lambda if you'd like. I wish you the best of luck. Um, okay, so this, what we have here is, you know, if I had to pick one policy gradient that's most commonly used, it probably looks like this one. 
So we say Q is too hard to learn, we're just going to use V, but we still want to reduce variance, so we have this baseline. Um, okay, so when we trained our critic, we trained the critic using some temporal difference algorithm. I didn't specify which one. But we could imagine that the critic was trained using some uh, variant of TD lambda. And the lambda, so the lambda parameter is not the same as the lambda parameter in the control variates. It's the lambda parameter for eligibility traces, where if we set that lambda parameter somewhere between zero and one, we can try to balance the, um, the bias variance trade-off. So, um, by, by mixing n-step updates when we estimate the critic in, uh, in, in exactly the right way. There's another way to balance bias and variance in the, um, in policy gradient methods, and that's to use different n-step returns in the policy gradient itself. So remember here I said, look, we're, we're taking one step closer to reinforce here by saying instead of just querying the critic, let's use a sample reward and then bootstrap off the critic in the next step. Well, we can move even further in the direction of reinforce if we like. In fact, we can occupy any point we want um, in between, at one, on the one hand, reinforce, and on the other hand, um, a sort of like traditional actor-critic approach where you just immediately cri uh, query the critic. So this yields an approach that's called a generalized advantage estimation. Um, so here we have an advantage function within the superscript, this k, and k indicates how long we wait until we bootstrap. So we saw, um, we saw you know, k equal to the horizon, that's a reinforce, and we saw k equals, uh, I guess, zero, uh, or uh, one. k equals one would give us, um, uh, I don't wanna get off by one error here. Um, if k equals one, then this would be zero, so then we would have um, an actor-critic approach. And you know, for any value of k, we can get these intermediate values where we use a certain number of sample rewards before we then bootstrap off of the critic. Okay, now if we do some, some algebra, we can manipulate this expression um, so that it looks quite different. So um, if we, uh, let's see. Right, so um, this delta term here is the TD error, right? So in the simple, in the simple version that we described here where we're not doing generalized advantage estimation, the TD error delta is this whole term, okay? So now if we look at, you know, suppose we set k equal to two instead of one. Now if we write out what we're doing there, we're summing up two sample rewards and then bootstrapping and then subtracting off the baseline. So if we rewrite that and group the terms differently, we see, okay, actually what we're doing here is just summing up two of these different deltas where these deltas are TD errors. So we're summing up two different um, TD errors. So more generally, for any value of K, we can write this expression um, as a sum of a bunch of TD errors with different discounting. So now what the generalized advantage estimator does is it takes all those different advantages, right? So each of these advantages is bootstrapping at a different point, And just like with eligibility traces, we're gonna add them up with some kind of exponential weighting scheme. So if we manipulate that, um, you know, that sum, then, you know, we can isolate all of the lambda terms, and these lambda terms then become, you know, these summations wh whose convergence is known. So if I, if I sum up all of these lambdas, I get one over one minus lambda. So that, that uh, occurs for each of these terms. And then the result is this nice expression here. So again, the, the, I'm summing up a bunch of deltas where each of these deltas is a TD error. Um, from a different moment in time, and then weighted according to this scheme that comes from this, uh, um, from the results of all these summations. So this one minus lambda here is canceling with the denominator. So that yields the generalized advantage estimator. So we have actually two different schemes working at the same time to balance bias and variance. This, um, the, choice of lam the choice of lambda here um, is going to uh, determine how we weight these different advantage estimates. Um, and then when we train the critic itself that we're bootstrapping off of, we can then use uh, TD lambda there also to, to balance bias and, and variance. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the, um, the, the core concepts of policy gradient methods. 
in, in deep learning, if we want to do deep actor critic methods, typically the actor and critic would both be deep neural networks. They may have both convolutional and recurrent layers. And uh, in many methods, they share layers. Uh, in fact, in some cases, they may share every layer except the last one. So, and they can both be trained with stochastic gradient descent. Um, so the actor is, is trained on the policy gradient. It's actually doing gradient ascent. And the critic is trained to minimize, you know, either TD lambda or SARSA lambda, depending on whether our critic represents V or Q. Um, so, you know, w one of the most um, well-known deep actor critic methods is called uh, A3C, uh, asynchronous advantage actor critic. So we have actually multiple actors being trained asynchronously in parallel. And the actor and the critic, they share a convolutional neural network. So we just use a softmax layer at the end for the policy and a linear layer for the value function. And at least the original method doesn't use um, generalized advantage estimates. It just does this case step bootstrapping. It just chooses uh, you know, one of these advantage estimates for a particular value of k to um, construct the policy gradient estimate. Um, okay, I want to talk about some of the more recent innovations in policy gradient methods. Um, so let's, but before we can do that, we need to, to discuss a bit of motivation. Um, and the motivation comes here from a practical problem that arises sometimes with policy gradient methods that is called performance collapse. Um, so the issue stems from the fact that when we take an update step, in a policy gradient method, we're taking an update step in parameter space. So the delta corresponds to a change in our parameter theta, or our vector, a parameter vector theta. Um, but what does theta represent? It's, it's, it's the parameters of some parametric representation of our policy, which at the end of the day uh, specifies a probability distribution of our actions for each state. And we don't really have any handle on the relationship between, you know, this, we take a certain step in parameter space, how much of a change is that going to induce in these probability distributions that control the actions that we select for each state? We don't have any handle on that at all. So it could be that, you know, a small change in parameter space yields a huge change in those probability distributions. Um, so here's a simple example that I stole from the internet. Um, you know, suppose we have a parameterization um, that just specifies the mean of a Gaussian. So here we have, you know, uh, a Gaussian represented by this blue line and it has some fixed variance and we just, the only theta is just the mean of this Gaussian. And let's suppose we perform an update um, so as to change this Gaussian from the blue one to the, to the orange one, okay? So that's what's happening in the top figure. Now let's suppose we just changed our parameterization. We said, okay, our parameterization is still going to be a Gaussian with a fixed variance, but now we've just changed what that variance is. We've changed that variance to be much smaller. And now we perform exactly the same update step that we performed before. So, you know, it's the distance traveled on the x-axis in these two figures is the same. But um, now we've moved from this blue one to this orange one. And if you think about the KL divergence between these two distributions compared to the KL divergence between these two distributions, they're radically different. So the same change in parameter space can yield a very different change uh, um, in the probability distributions. Um, so here's another example that I stole um, elsewhere um, from, from another set of lectures on the internet. Um, so let's suppose our the policy probability is governed by a sigmoid distribution. So we have now a discrete action space. We have two different actions, a, uh, one and two. And the probability of taking action one um, is a sigmoid function of our parameter theta. And the remaining probability goes to action two. Well, if you know what the sigmoid function looks like, it won't be surprising to you that if theta is quite large, then you know, changing theta from four to two yields only a small change in the policy probabilities because we're in the regime where the sigmoid function is nearly flat. Whereas if we t travel the same distance from two to zero, we get a dramatic change in the policy probability because now we've moved into the region where the sigmoid uh, is quite steep. So why does this matter? Um, so it matters in general for really any gradient, uh, any gradient based optimization. This problem is well known and you know, the natural gradient, which I'll talk about in a minute, is a kind of standard tool motivated by this problem in order to, to try to improve the performance of, of um, of uh, gradient descent-based methods. 
but it's of particular significance in policy gradient methods because of this issue called performance collapse. So the issue we have in reinforcement learning that we might not have in other applications of gradient descent is that um, the agent whose policy we're learning has some control over the data that will be collected in the future. So if you remember at the very beginning of day one, we said this is one of the fundamental challenges of reinforcement learning, that the agent is active in the learning process. The data it gets in the future depends in part on its policy. So, um, you know, that leads to a significant risk in the sense that if we, take a, if we take an update to improve the policy, but because of, you know, errors in our gradient estimate, that update actually makes the policy worse, Next time around, in the next episode, when we gather data using that new policy, we may get um, data that is less useful because we may have changed our policy to something which performs poorly and therefore no longer visits interesting states. And this is particularly bad news because if we've made a bad update to make our policy worse, we need that new data to fix the policy. So as an extreme example, you're training a robot uh, to walk and it walks, but not very well, so you're trying to improve its walk and you take a step in the wrong direction such that um, now when you run the new policy, the robot doesn't walk at all, it just falls over. So now you're not getting any interesting data. All the data you collect is from some extreme degenerate uh, set of states where the robot's just flailing around on the floor. You'll never be able to learn to walk from that, from, from that data that you're gathering. So that's what, that leads to this phenomenon called performance collapse. So in particular in policy gradient methods, we need to control these update steps um, to minimize the risk of performance collapse. Okay, so this leads us to the idea of natural policy gradients. So as I said, natural gradients is, is an old idea. Um, in 2001, Kakade extended the idea of a natural gradients to the policy gradient setting. So the idea is simply that we're going to try to constrain the distance that we travel when we take an update, not in parameter space, but in probability space, in policy space. So basically what we want to do when we take a step is we want to find the step um, delta theta that um, such that the new, pol the new um, policy, theta plus delta theta, maximizes our objective J, subject to the constraint that the KL divergence between the old policy and the new policy um, uh, is equal to some constant. So we're gonna bound the KL that we travel the, um, in any particular update step so as to mitigate the risk of performance collapse. Okay, so it's all very well and good to write down this optimization problem. How are we actually going to solve it? How are we actually going to find this delta theta? Um, well, in the natural policy gradients, the idea is that we're going to approximate this KL by doing a second order Taylor expansion. And if we do that Taylor expansion, then a bunch of terms nicely cancel. And we're left with um, this thing here, you know, which is based on our current um, theta. Uh, uh, sorry, it's based on the delta theta that we are considering and this thing F. And what is F? It's the Fisher information matrix. So you may not be familiar with the Fisher information matrix. The Fisher information matrix is the covariance of the score. So you remember this thing? We saw this before. It was used in the log likelihood, the score estimator trick. Uh, and it was, it was also used um, in the proof that the baseline is unbiased. This is the score. The covariance of the score is the Fisher information. Um, now that may seem a bit out of nowhere, um, but we can connect this to this optimization problem that we see here by noting that the, um, the Fisher information matrix is also equal to the Hessian of the KL um, at the point at which the two policies are the same. So when the two policies are the same, the KL will be zero, but the Hessian will um, be described by the Fisher information matrix. So, you know, this is, this is like the second order term of the Taylor expansion, all the other terms canceled. So the second order term, of course, involves the Hessian. That Hessian is the Fisher information. Okay, so if we use this and then use the method of Lagrangian multipliers to deal with this constraint, we end up with an update based on what's called the natural gradient. And the natural gradient is our original gradient multiplied by the inverse of the Fisher information matrix. So this is like a really nice idea, and it gives us a way to control the distance that we travel in probability space when we're doing gradient descent. The difficulty, as you could probably imagine, is that um, computing and inverting the Fisher information is intractable for um, the problems that we actually care about, where we'd like to do policy gradients on you know, some network with thousands or millions of parameters 
we'll never even be able to write down, uh, we'll never be able to invert that matrix. Okay, so, so natural policy gradients was primarily of theoretical interest until a few years ago when some, some uh, additional approximations were introduced. So, um, so one idea is that actually here, you don't actually need this um, inverse of the Fisher information. You just need this, the Fisher information multiplied by the original gradient. It's really just this quantity that you need to compute. And it turns out that that quantity can be computed by solving this um, um, equation here, you can solve this equation for the natural gradient using something called the conjugate gradient method. And the conjugate gradient method is an iterative method which um, builds uh, an increasingly accurate approximation to this quantity uh, on each iteration. And each iteration requires only computing a cheaper matrix vector product. So basically it's learning um, an approximation to this quantity um, that is a, a projection into a subspace, and on each iteration we're adding a new basis vector uh, so that the span of those vectors is the subspace we're projecting into. And we just, it turns out, need to compute the, this, the product of the Fisher information with this um, vector that's being added to the basis. So that's, that's the, the first idea. We can get a computational handle on uh, computing this natural gradient using this uh, conjugate gradient method. Um, so this was, this yields a method called truncated um, natural gradients. So truncated because the, the conjugate gradient method is run for some finite number of iterations and then stopped. Um, so that's one idea. The second idea is that, um, you know, even if we could compute the natural gradient exactly, suppose we could actually invert that, that Fisher information matrix and compute the natural gradient exactly, we still would be at some risk of performance collapse because we haven't actually solved this original optimization problem. Because remember, this natural gradient was based on this second-order Taylor expansion. So we could be wrong about the KL, and we could, we could, it's possible that if we take the step recommended by the natural gradient method, we actually have violated our trust region. The trust region being the, um, the, um, the region in which the KL is less than this constant that we fixed. So trust region policy optimization um, is a, a policy gradient method that, that got a lot of fanfare when it was released and it combines these two ideas. So um, it uses this conjugate gradient method to efficiently um, estimate the, the natural gradient. Then it performs a backtracking line search to try to ensure that the KL, um, that the trust region is not violated despite the second order approximation underlying the natural gradient. Um, so th there's actually two ideas here. So um, this here, this quantity here, um, theta i, uh, no, sorry. So theta, theta i is our um, existing policy parameterization before we take the update step. Delta i is a step recommended by the natural gradient method or by our, the approximation to it based on this conjugate gradient. Okay, but we don't totally trust that because it's just an approximation. So if we took that step, we might still be outside our trust region. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that step and multiply it by this parameter, and then we're going to um, we're going to do a line search to try to find the value of j, which will weight this parameter, such that the resulting update will actually be inside the KL, inside the trust region. Right. So we're going to do this line search to find this value such that we are inside the trust region. Um, there's one other constraint though, so we don't just want to be in the trust region. We also want to make sure that this quantity L is greater than zero. Um, and so I don't, I don't want to go too, too far off on a tangent about this, but there's um, a whole line of theoretical work um, in reinforcement learning and policy gradient methods in particular, but also in reinforcement learning in general about monotonic policy improvement. So if you're doing policy improvement, but the policy Im improvement is based on some estimate, then there's a risk that even though you were trying to improve the policy, the step you take will actually make the policy worse. So monotonic policy improvement in, it, it is sort of a line of research that's about, okay, can we, can we define some lower bound where we say, okay, if this, um, some lower bound on the improvement such that we can be ensure that the step that we take, if that lower bound is greater than zero, we can ensure that, we're, that we will at least be improving the policy. So there's, there's, you know, all kinds of theoretical work deriving those, those bounds. What we have here, this L thing, 
is an approximation to that. So this quantity here, it's based on um, our estimate of the advantage function and the ratio in the policy probabilities between the old policy and the new policy. And this thing here approximates some lower bound. So if this were the true lower bound and, and we could ensure it was greater than zero, we would be confident that our step would actually be an improvement. We still can't be totally sure because this thing is just an estimate, but basically we can minimize the risk of performance collapse by ensuring by first of all taking an approximate natural gradient step based on this conjugate gradient, but then coupling that with this backtracking line search to ensure that we have actually stayed in the trust region and that this estimate of the lower bound uh, is greater than zero. So that gives us multiple forms of assurance that the step we're taking is not too, too big. So as I said, TRPO got a lot of fanfare and there was a brief window in which it was kind of the state of the art policy gradient method. That window closed when um, po proximal policy optimization was introduced, which basically takes all of the ideas by TR from TRPO um, and turns it into something that is really practical and computationally efficient and can be used um, with deep reinforcement learning. So in TRPO, we still had to do this conjugate gradient descent, which is cheaper than inverting the Fisher information matrix, but is not, still expensive. And we have to do this line search, which can itself be expensive. So the idea behind po proximal policy optimization is, you know what, actually let's just solve an unconstrained optimization problem. So here we go back to our optimization problem. This is a constrained optimization problem. And what we can do is say, you know what, let's just solve an unconstrained optimization problem where instead of this being a constraint, we just have a penalty. So that's what um, PPO does. We just say, let's just take our, so this is actually this, um, uh, this same estimate of the lower bound that I mentioned before. And then we just add a penalty for, for violating the KL. We, sorry, we just add a penalty for, for the KL divergence. Now, of course, this parameter here that weights the KL, this becomes a very important parameter, um, you know, and, and you'd like to derive that in a principled way using Lagrangian multipliers, but instead, in the PPO method, it just has a simple, fairly hacky way of adapting this, um, this lambda parameter uh, on each iteration based on the size of the step that was taken on the previous iteration. So that's the original po proximal policy optimization method. There's another variant of PPO, which says, you know what, actually, you don't even need to do that. It actually suffices to just optimize some clipped objective. So the clipped objective um, is based on the advantage function um, weighted by this quantity R, and R is the ratio between the current policy, the, the policy probability under the current policy, and the policy probability under the previous time step. And then we have a clipped objective, which using the equation shown here, this is like a little bit hard to understand. Um, the figures help a little bit. So there's kind of two cases here. So one is the advantage function is positive. So that means, um, you know, the, 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 the corresponding action is a good one and it's one that we would like to take more. So the, our objective then, you know, on the x-axis here we have this ratio R. So, um, you know, as that ratio gets bigger, then the objective becomes larger because that's good. That means, you know, we want um, to increase, we want the probability of taking that action to be going up. But we don't want me to be too aggressive in our steps because we're worried about performance collapse, so it becomes clipped. We're not rewarded for having a ratio that's too large. And sort of analogously in the other direction, um, if the advantage is negative, then we would prefer the ratio to be small, but we don't want to reward really small values of R because um, that would mean taking too, uh, too aggressive a step in the wrong direction. And here, you know, the objective is going down if R is really big because that, that means that that would correspond to the setting in which the step we took last time was in the wrong direction. So we will want to quickly correct that by moving back in the other direction. So all of this is very heuristic, but it's kind of inspired by TRPO, which can itself be seen as an approximation to um, a natural policy gradient, all based on constraining the size of the step we take to avoid performance collapse. Um, okay. Any questions so far? Sorry, how is this L? Um, so that's here. 
So it's just our advantage estimate um, multiplied by the ratio of the policy probabilities. Uh, so Uh, so the, uh, the actual bound would involve an expectation. This is just an estimate of the bound that we can, that we can compute from the data that we have. So, so even if we satisfy this thing, this constraint here, we still are not sure that we have improved the policy because this, is, this isn't really the bound. It's just an estimate. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, uh, the, the ratio is based on the update that was made on the previous step. Other questions? Okay. Um, so for a long time, the conventional wisdom was that um, policy gradient methods required stochastic policies. Um, The original derivation of the policy gradient using the policy gradient theorem assumes stochastic policies and people had incorrectly concluded that that was an essential ingredient in the policy gradient and that it wasn't possible to do deterministic policy gradients. Um, but in 2014 that was proven wrong and the deterministic policy gradient theorem was derived. It looks uh, very similar to the policy gradient theorem that we know and love. Um, the new term here is the gradient of the um, critic of the value function with respect to the actions. So in, in, in like the original stochastic policy gradient a method, you can use continuous actions or discrete actions. Continuous actions are one of the key motivations for policy gradient methods, but you can absolutely do use policy gradient methods when you have, oh, sorry, when you have discrete actions. Um, but, um, for the deterministic policy gradient method, you have to have continuous actions because you have this term here, you have this requirement that the critic be differentiable with respect to the actions that this quantity doesn't even make any sense if we have discrete actions. Um, so what we're doing here is we're estimating a gradient that will allow us to, um, to optimize a deterministic policy. Um, but we cannot use that deterministic policy when we act in the world to gather data because then we will have no exploration, right? So this, just like in any policy gradient method, the gradient estimate will be based on some estimate of the Q function. The Q function needs to give us reasonable estimates for different values of A. And we're not gonna get that if we gather data using our deterministic policy, there will be no exploration. <clears throat> so that means we need to go off policy. So a sort of Im important step preceding the deterministic policy gradient method was an off-policy actor-critic method. So we're going to estimate this gradient um, using a trajectory that was gathered with a stochastic policy. So we learned about a deterministic policy using data gathered from a stochastic policy. And that stochastic policy um, is used to then train in an off-policy way to train a critic. And then that critic is used to estimate the policy gradient to improve our deterministic policy. And this is quite useful in practice because in many settings at the end of the day what you want to learn is a deterministic policy. Um, and <clears throat> stochastic policy gradient methods are not entirely satisfying if that's the case. <clears throat> so there's, there's another variant of this called expected policy gradients which was uh, an invention of, of, a, of um, a former postdoc in, in my lab. And it, the inspiration for this approach is, comes from expected SARSA. So, and if you remember with the SARSA method, we were doing policy evaluation, we're trying to estimate the Q function for some arbitrary policy, and the update rule um, involved, uh, um, involved the next sampled action. So at a certain point we had to bootstrap. To bootstrap we have to apply, supply a state action pair. We used the actual state action pair that the agent um, uh, took in the environment. And the idea behind expected SARSA was, you know, we might need to rely on a sampled next state because we don't have a transition function, but we don't need to rely on a sampled action because that action was drawn from a policy that is known to us. So we can actually just um, take an expectation across those actions using the known policy probability. 
So the same observation can apply in the policy gradient setting. So the policy gradient, um, not the estimate of the policy gradient, but the true policy gradient, is an expectation across both states and actions. But the expectation across actions, uh, we can actually compute because that's determined by the known policy probabilities of the policy that we're trying to optimize. So we just re-examine the policy gradient theorem. We say, hey, this term here, this thing, is just an integral. And we can compute that integral analytically, uh, depending on how our policy is, is parameterized. So for large families of policies, we can just analytically compute this integral. We don't need to rely on sampling the action. Um, so the expected policy gradient um, paper proves this like a new policy gradient theorem um, you know, for, for all these different families of policy parameterization. Sit back now? There we go. Okay. So for some particular families of parameterizations, for example, a Gaussian um, representation of the that people do is you, like you have some deep neural network and it outputs the mean action and then your policy is a Gaussian centered around that mean. That's like what's almost always done in practice. So then a, a special case of expected policy gradients called Gaussian policy gradients. Um, actually yields a nice unification with deterministic policy gradients. So in the original deterministic policy gradients paper, it's presented as an off-policy policy gradient algorithm for the reason I just said. We're learning about some deterministic policy um, using data gathered from a stochastic policy, so that's off-policy by definition. But if that um, stochastic policy that we use to gather data is just a Gaussian centered around the deterministic policy whose value uh, that we're trying to optimize, then we can actually take exactly the same update rule, exactly the same um, algorithm, and reinterpret it as an on-policy algorithm, as just a form of expected policy gradients, in which you know, what we're actually trying to do is learn about the stochastic Gaussian policy. But when we compute that integral, the result is the deterministic policy that, that from the original deterministic policy gradient perspective, was the policy we were trying to optimize. So the same algorithm can be viewed from both an on-policy or off-policy perspective. Um, so you can do this, of course, for discrete actions also. The integral just becomes a summation. It, assuming you don't have a zillion actions, that's trivial. Um, however, for, for continuous actions, this approach actually yields performance benefits. It's a really useful algorithm in practice. For discrete actions, it is not useful in practice. And the reason is um, not totally obvious. So if you, if you compute this integral or, um, you know, in the discrete case, this summation, you'll always be better off than if you just use a sampled action because you're just reducing the variance of your gradient estimate. It's like, a, it's like uh, there's no downside. Um, but if you compare, so if you compare an expected policy gradient method to the exact same algorithm where instead of performing this summation, you just use a sampled action, expected policy gradients will perform better. However, expected policy gradients requires you to have a critic that estimates Q. And remember, learning Q can be hard. So the baseline that you cannot beat in the discrete case is a baseline that says, you know what, forget about estimating Q. Let's just do the TD error-based policy gradient method where we, um, where we use a sample reward and then bootstrap off of V. And then, yeah, we're not able to perform this summation. We have to rely on sampled actions, but we have much less bias because we're relying on a critic that only had to learn V instead of Q. So for the discrete actions, uh, it turns out not to be useful in practice. But for continuous actions, it's a very good method. Um, okay, so that concludes the policy gradient portion of this lecture. So now would be a good time if there are any more questions. Okay, we have about half an hour, so I think that will give us a chance to say quite a few things about model-based reinforcement learning. I'm pleasantly surprised, because um, these lectures always take longer than I expect, so I assumed I would have run out of time by now. Um, but um, it's nice that, that we can talk about this concept, because it's another, you know, concept where if you've had an introduction to reinforcement learning, you should know what model-based reinforcement learning is. Um, okay, so switching gears a bit, setting policy gradient methods aside, um, Model-based reinforcement learning is a concept that I've 
hinted at a few times uh, in the discussion we've had so far. Um, the idea is simple. Um, the idea behind model-based reinforcement learning is simply to take the data that we get as we interact with, interact with the world, and instead of using it to like, directly estimate a policy, like in a policy gradient method, or to directly estimate a value function from which we derive a policy, as um, value function methods like um, SARSA Q learning would do. Instead, we're going to add yet another level of indirection. We're going to use the data to estimate a model and then feed that model to our favorite planning method, value iteration, policy iteration, sample based planning, whatever you like, to um, estimate a value function. And then from that value function, we'll get our policy. So this is in, in contrast with the model free methods we've been talking about so far policy gradient methods. Q learning, SARSA, these are all model free methods. Um, so, what is a model? A model is anything that helps the, the agent make predictions about what will happen in the world. So, we can think sort of usefully about three different kinds of models. So, the first type is a full or distribution model. And this is exactly the, 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 um, the um, formal description of the Markov decision process that we had at the beginning when we formulated the reinforcement learning process. So if you have a full model, you have a complete description of the Markov decision process. That means you actually know the transition and reward functions. <clears throat> For any state action pair, you can submit a query, and the model will tell you the entire distribution over S prime, or it will tell you the true um, value, of, uh, the true expected value of the immediate reward you will receive um, for the corresponding state action pair. Um, so, you know, in the tabular case, this model will have space complexity S squared A because we will, you know, for, for, for every S and S prime and A, we will need to specify a probability. Um, so that's like the best kind of model you could have. Of course, this kind of model is hard to come by. So the next best thing is a sample or generative model where basically, um, again, we can submit a query for any state action pair we like, but instead of getting back the, the full distribution over S prime, all we get back is a sample from that distribution. So I give you uh, S and A, and you give me back some S prime sampled from this probability distribution. And then the, the sort of weakest form of model is a trajectory or simulation model, which is like a generative model, but we remove the ability to teleport to any state action pair we like. So in a generative model, um, you can query any state action pair. It doesn't matter whether you actually are able to get to that state action pair using some policy. Whereas with the trajectory model, all we can do is start from some initial state, select actions using some policy, and then observe some, some, um, some next states and, and, and rewards. So it's a simulator that we can interact with and generate sort of um, a simulated data but we cannot just teleport to any state we like. We cannot submit queries about state action pairs we're interested in, but that we don't know how to reach. Okay. So interacting with, with, a, with a trajectory model is the same as interacting with the real world. The only difference is the costs you're incurring are not sample costs, they're just computational costs. You're running the simulator, and the rewards you generate are, are hypothetical. They don't correspond to real world costs. Okay. So, you know, the, the sort of key motivation for model-based methods is, is about sample efficiency. So a naive approach like Q-learning, we interact with the world, we get our data point, we use it to perform an update, and we throw it in the bin. And that's very sample inefficient. And we're, you know, we're in a regime where sample efficiency is more important than, than in almost any other area of machine learning um, because the data is expensive and dangerous to collect. So that's crazy. Um, so we want something that's going to be more sample efficient. Up until now, the only thing we saw for sample efficiency was experience replay. Um, and experience replay gives us a, a way to reuse the data, but in a very simplistic way. Uh, with the model, what we can do is actually generalize um, beyond the data that we've seen. So we take our data, we use it to fit some model. From that model, we can generate new data points that, that might never ever have existed in our replay buffer, but we can still use them for learning. So, you know, a sort of pet peeve of mine is that, you know, uh, in a, in a reinforcement learning paper about model-based RL, they always have some introductory paragraph where they say, why should we do model-based RL? And it always says, because it's more sample efficient than model-free RL. Um, but that isn't really true, necessarily, because you can be model-free but still do experience replay. So you can be sample efficient while remaining model-free. 
Um, and you can be model-based, but not necessarily be more sample efficient because it depends on the quality of the model that you learn. So at the end of the day, what it really comes down to is inductive bias. The advantage of a model over something like experience replay is the ability of the model to generalize. And in reinforcement learning, you have some choices about where and how you do the generalization. You could um, you know, use the reinforce method where you're doing policy gradient methods and you, the only thing you parameterize is your policy. So if there's any generalization, it's happening in the policy. So you better stick all your prior knowledge into choosing a good parametric form for your policy. You don't even have a critic because you're just estimating the gradient from sample returns. Or you could take an actor critic approach or a Q learning or SARSA based approach where you also have this value function and the value function itself could be some function approximator that generalizes. So that's another opportunity for generalization both in the policy and in the value function. And you know, you better choose a good parametric form for your value function so the generalization works out well. Now with model based methods, you have a third opportunity to generalize because the model could have a parametric form so that you feed some data into it, you fit that model and then you generalize from that, from the learned model. So, you know, the question of sample efficiency or the quality of the method is going to come down to where is your prior knowledge, what form is your prior knowledge in, and where is it useful to stick it in so as to improve the generalization. So I think if there is a compelling argument for model-based methods, it's not that it's inherently more sample efficient, but it's that the prior knowledge that you are likely to have will be in, in a form that can be expressed more easily in the model than in the policy or the value function. So the prior knowledge you have about the world might be something like, you know, this, 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 pro this markup decision process describes a robot interacting with a world that is governed by Newtonian mechanics, you know? That's, that's a very important piece of prior knowledge that you likely have in your robot control problem, you know, that, that isn't built into the reinforcement learning algorithm. And that prior knowledge is about the world. It's about the transition function of the MDP. It's not about, you know, what's a good parametric form for the value function. It doesn't say anything about how smooth or sp spiky or whatever that value function might be. So many times we have prior knowledge uh, about the transition function that we can stick into a, a, a model that we can't stick into the policy or the value function. Um, and in that case, model-based RL is likely to, to give us a, big a, a lot of leverage. Um, so here's a very simple um, model-based method, what Sutton calls tabular Q planning. So it's exactly our Q learning algorithm. The only difference is we're performing um, our updates not on data points sampled from a stream of interaction with the world, but on data points sampled from our model randomly. So we randomly select a state action pair. We ask our model for the reward and the next state. Then we use the resulting tuple to do a Q-learning update. <coughs> so it's just Q-learning where you interact with the model instead of the world, and you can jump around to whatever state you want. Again, this assumes you have a generative model, not a uh, trajectory model. <coughs> So Sutton's favorite form of model-based RL is an architecture that he came up with called the Dyna architecture. And the Dyna architecture mixes model-free and model-based learning. So, you know, we have, we interact with our environment, we generate some real data. We use that data to do a direct update. So, you know, we just do Q-learning or SARSA immediately on the data we collected. But then we also feed that data to our model learner. And then using the model, we generate some new data, some simulated experience, which we also use to update our policy and value function. We do the two together. Um, <clears throat> so I, I won't bore you with the pseudocode, but <clears throat> basically here we have our direct update based on the data we actually collected. We feed that to the model, and then we can, you know, generate n pieces of simulated data to do some additional updates. So you won't be surprised to learn that, you know, if we set n greater than zero, we can speed up learning. So on the x-axis, we have episodes of interaction with the real world. And on the y-axis, we have, you know, the steps taken by the agent in this navigation task. So fewer steps is better. And, you know, if we do 50 planning steps before we, we um, generate each new piece of real data, then we, our value function will learn much more quickly. So that's, that's not surprising. <clears throat> so... Uh, um, one of the other things that model-based RL really opens the door to is smart exploration. So exploration is, is a, you know, one of the most important topics in reinforcement learning. Some people might say the most important topic in reinforcement learning. <clears throat> and it's one I talked about heavily at the beginning because when we started from the Karen Bandit problem, 
The only challenge there was about expiration. Um, but when we went to the full reinforcement learning problem, we kind of set expiration aside. We talked about epsilon greedy expiration, and you know, in the policy gradient method, we talked about you know, adding some Gaussian noise around your policy to ensure sufficient expiration. We haven't really talked about smart expiration at all since you know, the UCB algorithm for the banded setting. Um, and it's, while it's not essential to take a model-based approach to do smart expiration in the full reinforcement learning problem, it's certainly much easier uh, with a model, and it's much more intuitive to think about how to do smart expiration given a model. So here's a simple example, uh, an algorithm called DynaQ+, where um, basically, as we build our model, we keep track of how many times we visited every state action pair. And then, you know, we're going to give, as we, as we do our planning and learning, we're going to give the agent not just the rewards generated by the environment or the rewards predicted by the model, but we're going to give it some extra rewards, some bonuses for exploring. Um, so in the DynaQ plus algorithm, if it's been a long time since we visited this state, then we get a large bonus. This is going to encourage us to return to states that we haven't visited uh, in a long time. To, to explore in a more systematic way. Um, okay, so the Dyna architecture, um, it, it mixes model-free learning with sample-based planning. So it takes this model and it uses it to generate samples, and then those samples are treated as if they came from the real world and we do our normal queue updates. Um, so a sort of more archetypal approach to model-based reinforcement learning, an algorithm which, to my knowledge, <clears throat> doesn't actually have an official name. I don't know that anyone actually wrote a paper about it. Um, so I'm just calling it vanilla model-based reinforcement learning. It works as follows. The agent interacts with the world, taking some exploratory action based on some greedy policy. <clears throat> the, the data that was collected, the immediate reward and state, are used to update some maximum likelihood model. So in the maximum likelihood model, the reward that we predict for a given state is just a sample average. Of, the, of all the rewards that we've, you know, received every time we took that action in that state. And the transition probability is just, uh, you know, as you would expect, it's just the um, number of times that the corresponding transition occurred divided by the number of times we took that action in that state. Right? So it's just a maximum likelihood model learned from the data. Okay, now we feed this model to our favorite um, dynamic programming algorithm like value iteration. <clears throat> value iteration gives us a new greedy policy. We use the greedy policy to act in the world plus some expiration. Um, so, you know, this is very computationally expensive because this whole planning step, dynamic programming, which as we saw before, um, you know, while it might be more efficient than a naive approach, it suffers from the curse of dimensionality. We're gonna have to do this planning step, um, this run, a whole run of a planning algorithm every step of interaction with the world. Every time we get a new data point, we have a new model, we have to redo the planning. Um, of course, we don't have to plan to convergence, we could just do a couple sweeps of value iteration, um, or, and we also don't have to plan from scratch. So we could initialize that planner using the, you know, the, the policy and or value function that was the result of planning on the previous step. So this can be made computationally efficient, and you can also think of it as like an anytime algorithm where you get you know, you gather this data from the world, you update your model, and then you, you plan on the model basically as long as you can until time runs out and you need to act. Um, okay, so an algorithm for doing smart exploration, which is built on top of this vanilla model-based reinforcement learning approach, is called RMAX. Um, unfortunately, this algorithm is um, totally useless in practice. Um, but uh, it's actually one of my favorite algorithms because I think it's a very beautiful idea, um, and I think there are some key insights that underlie it that um, you know should be the foundation of, of practical algorithms, and, and arguably it is the foundation of some practical algorithms. So here's the idea: um, if you remember from upper confidence bound algorithm for the for the bandit setting, we we were always going to act greedily with respect to this upper confidence bound, and this was motivated by what's called the principle of optimism in the face of uncertainty. We're going to say the upper confidence bound of our estimate of the value of each arm is like um, looking at the world through rose-colored glasses. It's like an optimistic view of the world. And if we act greedily in an optimistic world, 
we will, um, that will drive us to explore the things that are promising but uncertain. That was the motivation. So the same idea here, but now extended to the full Markov decision process. So the optimism works as follows. So we're doing our vanilla model-based reinforcement learning. However, every time we update our model, we're then gonna take a look at that model and say, okay, for any state action pairs in this model, where the maximum likelihood estimate for that state action pair was based on um, an amount of data which is less than some threshold M. So for some state action pair, I have a maximum likelihood estimate of the transition and reward probabilities. But if those estimates are based on fewer than M data points, then I'm gonna say, you know what? I don't trust this part of the model because there isn't enough data. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna remove all those transitions from the model that I don't trust. And I'm gonna instead assume that for that state action pair, the transition always takes me to some fictional jackpot state where I obtain the maximal possible reward, R max, hence the name, and I'm stuck there. In the jackpot state, I can never leave. I just keep getting this jackpot reward, okay? So basically, if I'm not sure about the model, I'm gonna assume that part of the model um, is as good as it could possibly be. Anything I'm unsure about will take me to this dream scenario where I'll get the maximum possible reward forever until I die. Now I take this optimistic model and I feed it to my planning algorithm. And this planning algorithm will return to me a greedy policy which is optimal with respect to this optimistic model. And this greedy policy is not optimal in the true MVP, but it's a great exploration policy. Because what will this policy do? It will, dry, it will take um, uh, sequences of actions that will drive me to the states that I'm uncertain about. Because according to this policy, doing so is gonna get me the jackpot reward. So I've trained this agent to seek these jackpot rewards. And when I get there, I don't get the jackpot, but I get some data about the world, about the part of the world I was uncertain about. So this is a systematic way to efficiently explore the world um, by rewarding the agent, uh, driving the agent towards the parts of the world you're uncertain about. Fantastic idea. Um, yeah. So we never actually visit the jackpot state. The jackpot, the jackpot state is a fiction. So when we're planning, we plan on an MDP that includes that jackpot state. The result of planning is a policy that we execute in the real MDP where the jackpot state doesn't exist. So we're following this policy that we learned in this optimistic model and we think, okay, I'm getting, coming to the jackpot state. When we get there, we're disappointed there's no jackpot. But what there is, is data that we need to improve our model. Yeah, so the, um, the, uh, the result of planning will be a closed loop policy. So that policy will tell us how to act in every possible state, even if the planning algorithm thinks we'll never visit that state because it thinks, oh, you'll be in a jackpot state that will never go anywhere. Um, so that, that assumption of the planning algorithm will be violated when we follow the policy in the real world. Nonetheless, for every state, the policy tells us what to do, so that's what we'll do. And at the end of the episode, uh, we'll update our model. Or uh, actually, we can do it every time step. We can update the model and um, uh, replan. But you know, like if, um, if the number of times we visited that state action pair is much less than M, then even when we visit it, it will still be a jackpot state. So even if we replan immediately when we get there, we'll prob the planner will still consider it a jackpot state unless we were right by the threshold. Um, but nonetheless, the output of planning is always a policy that tells you what to do in every state. Yeah. Yeah, um, good question. Um, so, uh, 
the, the, um, the argument is basically a theor theoretical one. So um, as I said, RMAX is not a useful algorithm in practice. The main reason it was developed was to, um, to uh, identify a, a, a way to do reinforcement learning that would satisfy what's called um, a PAC MDP guarantee. So I have a slide about this later, if we don't run out of time. Basically, uh, a PAC guarantee is, a, is a, a theoretical bound on the sample complexity of the learning algorithm. Um, in order to satisfy that bound, in order to show that the algorithm satisfies the bound, you use an analysis based on the Hufting bound. The Hufting bound is a concentration inequality um, that describes how your estimate uh, of the expected value of a random variable, the rate at which it concentrates around the true value of that random variable. Um, now, in the Hufting bound, um, the, uh, the, the looseness of the bound is uh, determined by how many data points your estimate is based on. So there's like the expected value of the random variable, and then there's your estimate. That estimate is based on some number of data points. How many data points is going to determine how tight the Hufting bound is? Um, there are other bounds, um, like there's uh, something called the Bernstein bound, which, unlike the Hufting bound, actually takes into account the variance. So in the Hufting bound, it just matters how many times, how many data points you have, not what the variance of those data points is. Um, but there's, there are other bounds called the Bernstein bound, which is not used in this analysis, um, but which takes the variance into account. And you can imagine a smarter algorithm where, the, um, uh, where your uncertainty about the model is based not just on the number of data points you've collected, but on like the empirical variance of those data points. Um, so there's, there's a, a sort of a, like a competitor to RMAX, an algorithm called model-based interval estimation, which is basically like, like the upper confidence bound algorithm, but um, for the Markov decision process, and where these confidence intervals are constructed using a, something like a Bernstein bound that takes the variance into account. Um, but for various reasons, if the, so that algorithm performs better empirically, but for various reasons, the theoretical guarantees are actually weaker. Um, so basically, this is like the simplest possible way to quantify your uncertainty is just based on the number of data points you have. And the guarantees follow from that. Um, I have 10 minutes left, so I'm trying, let me try to decide what I do and don't want to talk about. Um, right, so uh, I'll just spend one minute on this and then we'll move on. So. Um, I think the point was clear already, but you know, in, in the Dyna algorithm, we're doing sample-based planning. We're taking our algorithm and we're using it to sample transitions and update based on them. In the vanilla-based, model-based algorithm and in the RMAX algorithm, we're doing full, like traditional dynamic programming, full planning. And in full planning, you, you have to do these full backups, right? Every time you do a value iteration update, you're gonna have to like compute an expectation that's gonna involve summing over all these different branches in this tree. Um, so if you have a large complex problem, these, these updates are going to be prohibitively expensive. And the alternative is to do these sample-based backups like in the Dyna algorithm. This is one of the arguments why Sutton is a big fan of Dyna, basically. It's an argument, not necessarily for Dyna in particular, but for any sample-based uh, uh, planning step inside your model-based algorithm. So these are some results that show that, you know, like as the branching factor of the problem grows, so as the, the uh, breadth of that tree increases, um, the cost of doing a full backup becomes prohibitively expensive. And you can get, you know, like almost all of the performance improvement by doing, by just sampling a small number of backups instead of doing a full backup. So for real world problems, if you're gonna plan on a learned model, you're probably gonna be doing sample-based planning. Um, I'm thinking maybe I'll skip this because we talked a little bit about prioritized sweeping yesterday as a prelude to prioritized replay. Remember, prioritized sweeping is a way to focus your planning steps on the, um, on the states that are most likely to be affected by the update you just made to your model based on your most recent data point. So I assume we skip that. Okay, so now we have a few slides about theory that might give some, a bit more context to the answer I just gave. So this slide is actually just a reminder of what we talked about before. The, the naive methods, the model-free temporal difference methods, Q-learning and SARSA, they have theoretical guarantees convergence guarantees. But all these convergence guarantees say is that, the, that we will converge to the optimal policy in the limit. And as you remember, there were some conditions here 
we needed a finite state space, we needed to have a finite variance, gamma needs to be less than one, and we needed to have this glee property that says that we're going to do an infinite amount of learning on every state action pair, but we will be greedy in the limit. So, you know, better to have a convergence guarantee than not to have one, but um, we'd like to have an algorithm that can, that can learn the optimal policy, you know, in less than infinite time. Is that too much to ask? Um, so this brings us to this uh, formal model called PACMDP. So if you know anything about uh, learning theory, you're probably familiar with this, um, with this model, the probably approximately correct model. So the idea in general in machine learning is we want for an algorithm to be able to say something about its sample complexity, so that is the number of samples that we need in order to achieve some threshold. And in the PAC model, that threshold is that the thing we've learned should be a probably approximately correct. So with high probability, the thing that we learn should be within epsilon of the optimal thing. Okay, so it's not totally obvious how to extend this to the reinforcement learning setting, but um, some people have done that yielding this PAC-MDP formulation. So in, in the PAC-MDP framework, we have some algorithm, and at every, if we follow this algorithm, at every time step, we'll have some policy, AT. So AT is the policy that will be learned by algorithm A at time T. So the sample complexity of that algorithm is the number of time steps for which the value function of the policy learned by the algorithm at that point in time in the current state is more than epsilon less than the optimal value function at that state. So we're interacting with the world. Every time we visit a state, uh, there's some true optimal value function for that state. And then there's the, value, the true value function of the policy that our algorithm has learned up until now. If the gap between the two is bigger than epsilon, um, then we're still accruing sample complexity. Once that's no longer true, then, um, then uh, we stop accruing a sample complexity and, um, and we're sort of done learning. So, uh, you know, for a, pack, for a pack MDP algorithm, we want to be able to say that the sample complexity of our algorithm, so the number of time steps it will take before this threshold is reached, will be some polynomial function of all the key things that, that describe the problem. You know, the size of the state in action space, the, the size of the reward, um, you know, the, the discount factor, et cetera, et cetera. So we would like the sample complexity to grow only polynomially with, with respect to the size of the problem. Um, so, so R max is a, a pack MDP algorithm. And that pack MDP um, guarantee comes from the fact that, you know, using the Hufting bound, we can argue that if we visited the, um, if we visited every state action pair at least M times, then the Hufting bound will tell us our maximum likelihood model can only be so wrong for all of those state action pairs. Um, and if our maximum likelihood model can only be so wrong, then the policy that we get from planning on that model can also only be so wrong. So we're then able to satisfy this threshold, provably, um, by visiting every state action pair m times. And because Rmax is so efficient about exploring the state space, it can visit every state action pair m times, uh, given only a polynomial number of interactions with the world. Okay, the problem with the PAC guarantee um, is that it only describes the value of, for the states that are actually visited by the agent. So, so there are actually two problems here. So first of all, um, before we reach the threshold, the errors that we make could be as catastrophic as we like. The PAC guarantee doesn't penalize us for accruing millions, billions of negative reward points um, during the learning process. So you know, who knows how many, how many um, you know, nuclear apocalypses we've caused during the exploration phase, as long as after a polynomial number of samples, we got our PAC policy, then we're good. Um, so that's one problem. There's no bound on the re negative reward we accrue during learning. The other problem is that the exploration process itself may actually um, doom us to achieving suboptimal reward even after we've done learning. So suppose we managed to avoid a nuclear apocalypse while we were learning, and we got our PAC, our PAC policy, great, and it only took us a polynomial number of samples, but along the way, we got stuck in some suboptimal region of the state space where the rewards available to us are much less than those that would be accrued by an optimal policy that, that um, hangs out in a different part of the state space. So notice here, the sample, to meet the sample complexity requirement, 
we only have to be within Epsilon for the states that we're actually visiting using this policy. Um, but those states could be states where very little reward is to be had. And our policy could be arbitrarily wrong in some other region, and we may never be able to get back to that region because our expiration may have stuck us in some bad place. So we can make a stronger guarantee by actually bounding the regrets. So, you know, smart expiration all comes from this bandit literature, and in the bandit literature, people are mostly focused on bounding the regret. Not just saying, can we learn something good quickly, but can we actually limit the total amount of suboptimality, the total sum of suboptimal consequences of everything we've done the whole time we've interacted with the world. That's typically the goal in a bandit algorithm. So we can get the same notion of regret in the, in the MDP setting, but then we need to make some stronger assumptions. So in order to deal with this, this issue of like, what if we get stuck in some suboptimal region, we, these regret bounds are gonna depend on something called the diameter. And the diameter is a quantification of how long it takes to get from you know, any one state in the MDP to any other state in the MDP. So you know, if we have an MDP where like, you can really get stuck in one region and you can never get back to, the, to some other region, then the diameter will be infinite. And then again, the, the, the regret will also be infinite, potentially infinite, because we can't rule out the possibility that we get stuck somewhere where we can never get as much reward as the optimal policy would. Um, I'm running out of time, so I have to make some hard choices here. I'm going to do one more slide, and then we will stop. Um, all of this stuff of theoretical interest, RMAX, um, model-based interval estimation, all of these smart exploration algorithms, totally useless in practice. However, there have been some very, um, very significant strides in bringing those ideas to deep reinforcement learning so that they can be used to do smart exploration in, you know, large-scale real-world problems, a very exciting and important development because exploration is so crucial to reinforcement learning. Um, and one of the first and, and I think sort of most elegant uh, ways of doing this was, was a paper from 2016 called Pseudocounts. And the idea is, is quite nice. So um, instead of trying to train um, a, a true model, like a transition model, um, we're just going to train a, an unconditional generative model. So, you know, we're trying to solve some large-scale reinforcement learning problem like, like some Atari game or something. And, you know, the state space is really high dimensional. Learning a good transition function, hopelessly difficult. So what we're going to do is say, like, we'll just take all the states that we visit while we learn, and we'll just pretend they were all drawn from some unknown distribution. And then we try to train a generative model to fit that distribution. So now we have an unconditional sort of prop P of S. That's what we're learning. Now, we're going, to, we're going to pretend that this model was a count-based model. So remember, this RMAX algorithm that does smart exploration, it's based on keeping these counts about every state action pair. How optimistic should we be for that state action pair is going to depend on the count. But these counts, it's totally unscalable, right? Outside the tabular setting, if I have millions of states, I, there's no way that I can maintain these counts. And anyway, all the counts will be one or zero. In any interesting problem, you'll never visit exactly the same state more than once. So the counts are useless. So instead, we have this notion of a pseudocount. So we train this generative model, and then we say, let's suppose this generative model was a count-based model. Of course, it isn't, because if it was a count-based model, it wouldn't generalize well to this large state space. Instead, our model is like some big neural network or some parametric thing. But let's pretend it was a count-based model. And then let's ask ourselves, if this was a count-based model, what count would that model have to have for the current state in order to explain the change in probability that we observe when we update the model with a new data point? So this mu hat, this was our, the generative model that we fit to the data. And then we visited a new state. We got one more data point. We use it to update our model. The new model is mu hat prime. So what count would this mu hat model need to have if it was a count-based model so as to explain the difference between mu hat and mu hat prime. So that's what's shown here. This turns out to just be um, a linear system of equations that we can solve to compute what the count would have been to explain this discrepancy. That's called the pseudo count. And you know, this pseudo count doesn't actually correspond to any number that's stored inside the generative model because it's not even a count based model. But we can use that pseudo count to quantify some expiration bonuses that we give to the agent while it's learning to encourage it to visit states that, that it has high uncertainty about because those states trigger large changes in our generative model. So we get the, the, the smart expiration, the quantification of our uncertainty, we need to do the smart expiration, 
uh, while having a scalable model that doesn't rely uh, on actually keeping counts. Um, okay, I've run out of time, so, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much for, for listening. I hope this was a useful introduction to reinforcement learning, and I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you.